Hey, everyone. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me OK. Um, thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is uh, Deborah Guzman Barrios. You can call me Deb for short. Um, and I am part of the developer strategy group here at Oculus. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, some of the stories, uh, success stories that we have seen in VR across two years of uh, shipping over 200 titles uh, on Touch alone. Uh, so really quick, uh, real quick look at the agenda. We're going to focus on three points. One of the things that, uh, one of the questions that we get asked a lot here at, at, uh, at Oculus Content is, um, what do you guys want to see? Like, what, what's successful in VR? What works? What should we build? Um, and to speak to that, I will say that uh, the, one of the most important bits is presence. Um, and this harkens back to the OG Oculus days um, when we used to talk about presence and how important it was uh, to achieve true immersion in VR. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is we're going to go through a couple titles. These have all been really successful titles on the store that have managed to um, bring presence to users and players and really bring delight. Um, these are all uh, some of the points that we'll talk about today are things that have uh, resulted in increased engagement, adoption, retention, which are all really important things for your title. Um, so I would say that we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how design and controls in VR and how thinking about them from day one uh, really attributes to the sense of presence. Um, and then we'll be going through around 15 titles. Um, so to get started with a, a really quick intro, uh, here at uh, the Developer Strategy Group, uh, we want to be your point of contact between the company um, and yourselves as content creators. Um, also, a quick hello to everybody on the live stream. Uh, and it's important for us uh, that you are successful. Like We gauge uh, our success as a content group by your success as developers. Um, so what you'll see today is a little bit of things that uh, some of the highest and, and most successful performing titles uh, on the platform have done uh, that have all been in that pursuit of presence. So you'll hear me talking about presence a lot over and over in the talk, but it's because it's so important. Um, so let's just get started real quick with a classic, uh, Arizona Sunshine by Vertigo Games. Um, this is one of our earliest titles on the platform, and I'll be using this screen a lot to sort of convey a little bit of what I want to talk about. For all of these, I actually went and captured in-game footage because um, a lot of our art sometimes is third person, so it doesn't really convey like how it actually looks when you're in the headset. Um, so we'll talk a little bit real quick on these uh, because I have uh, quite a couple titles that I want to show you today. Um, so s speaking a little bit here to um, hands and hand presence, one of the things that um, the Vertigo Games team was able to do was to find a way to sort of like take advantage of touch as an input device, um, but not necessarily having to uh, show your entire hand because we don't have motion data for that. Um, and, and it can get really expensive really quickly to try to solve that problem. Um, they were able to, to just cut it right here at the hands and make that feel really, really good and accurate and precise, um, which again serves to presence because the last thing you want to feel is uh, looking at your hand and then figuring out, like, that's not where my arm is. Um, and then that broke immersion, and that's exactly what we don't want. Like, we want you to be feeling like you're part of this world. So uh, the Arizona Sunshine team was able to, to pull that off with a couple other things. Um, first off, like, really clean uh, HUD, um, nothing in your eyes. Because in real life right now, well, until AR catches up, we don't have anything that's actually overlaid over our eyes. Um, so really being wary of that really helps and serves, again, the pursuit of presence. Um, when it comes to damage, uh, they were able to come up with a way of sort of like tinting your screen. And again, I'm going to show it throughout the different titles uh, because I want you to see like this is a common trend. And it's a great way of showing uh, your players like you need, to, you need to pay attention because something's happening. But uh, one of the things to keep, keep track of is you don't want to close people's eyes because they're not actually closing their eyes in real life. Uh, so that's one way that can get a little bit tricky. Uh, so this is a clever way of sort of being able to convey the fact that you are taking damage um, and have the player act on it. Really funny here. Um, I thought I had cleared all of these out, uh, but then all of a sudden I heard something out of the corner of my ear, and she was just charging at me. So you can uh, see a little bit. My hands are all over the place because I was trying to figure out what to do. Um, and then a, a little bit to touch a little bit on ammo. Um, they had to find a way to show players like how you're doing, how much, how many bullets do I have left? Uh, so they were able to do an ammo belt right here around the waist um, so that it was available whenever you needed it. You could just look down 
and it would be available for you. Um, especially in Arizona, because you only have a finite amount of ammo, which again also serves in, into the pursuit of presence and really immersing you in this world and making you feel like, hey, I need to keep an eye out uh, for how I'm doing. And also when it came to the ammo itself, having that, and I'll talk a lot, I'll talk a lot about this today, tactile interactions, so really having people grab things and bring them in, uh, is something that, especially with touch, works really well. Uh, they were able to actually grab the ammo, you come over, you holster it, very straightforward. Um, and all, again, uh, in clean UI, but whenever you need something, you can just look at it. You want to check your health. Uh, you want to look down. Very easy, very straightforward, um, without breaking immersion. So moving over to another very uh, classic, uh, popular title, uh, uh, I Expect You to Die by Shell Games. Um, here you get to become a super secret spy agent. Um, and they were able to get away with a couple of things because of that. Um, I would say that... You you know, they, they decide, for example, this system where you actually point to what you want and you pull the trigger and you drag it to you with the joystick is something that you actually can't do in real life, but it comes off feeling as a bit of a superpower, which sort of plays to the strength of the fact that you're a secret agent. Um, so it's something that within the world makes sense and makes you feel cool, and you can't do enough of that. Uh, another thing to point out here is the fact that, uh, and this is really important, and we tell a lot of our developers this, is text is important. Um, and depending on the title, and you'll see further out, some titles need to convey more information. Uh, they were able to find a way of sort of overlaying the text on the real world um, so that it, it still feels comfortable, but it's not taking away from the experience. Um, and also when it comes to their object interaction system, uh, again, they, they decided to give you options, uh, which is something that is also great. Like you always want to give a player options in different ways of tackling a problem. Uh, in this case, uh, a lot of the game takes place in you sort of like remaining in a stationary position while you have to interact with a lot of environments around you. So they did a really good job at making everything interactable. And that's another thing that you'll see a lot in VR and presence is uh, we get our users used to everything that I can see that sort of looks remotely grabbable, they're going to grab it and they're going to want to grab it. Um, and all of a sudden, like these mundane interactions in real life suddenly become really exciting. Like pushing a door feels really good. Um, if you can nail that. So, so they were able to do a lot of that really well, like things like the knife, uh, actually screwing. Um, well, it's an electric screwdriver, but sort of being able to really interact with your environment and feel like you have control over it. And then again, I'll, I'll keep touching on this. The hands that they used were gloves, and they were up to here. And that felt really, really good. Again, really attributing to that sense of presence. Coming over to In Death by Soulfar Studios. Um, in in depth, uh, the Soulfar team worked really hard at bringing replayability uh, to their title so that people could come back and keep feeling like they had a fresh experience. So you'll see here that uh, they went with a procedurally generated approach. Um, what that ended up doing was that combined with achievements makes you sort of want to come back and keep iterating, keep getting better at what you do, uh, which speaks a lot to my competitive side um, because I want to be the best, and I work really hard to try to beat other folks. So leaderboards, uh, achievements are a great way to sort of like engage your community, um, and procedurally generated ends up giving players a fresh experience every time, uh, which also plays really well for what they've done. Um, and then another thing to point out within Death is they got really creative with locomotion. Um, they could have gone the traditional joystick, and I'm just going to move forward or back, but they decided to bring it into the core gameplay. Um, by actually having the bow that you're using the entire game be part of that. Uh, so then they give you two options. You could do the classic B and point and then shoot where you were going, and that felt very precise, which is part of what makes it feel really good. But then they also gave you like a fight and, fight and flight response. So all of a sudden I was getting, uh, and you'll see it here, I was getting a little bit overwhelmed by a bunch of enemies. Um, so I, they have little lightning bolts that you can sort of like throw around and make your way around. So uh, really giving players the sense of control over the environment, um, but also doing a, a locomotion solution that was within the world of what you expected to have. Um, and another bit to add here is, uh, and you'll see it on some of the titles, they had to find a way to convey your health and how you were doing. Um, so they were able to incorporate the actual health bar into the bow, uh, into the weapon, so that it was, it was out of sight, but whenever you needed, you could just look at your bow and you would see how you were doing. Um, and then my favorite thing probably in Endeath is how precise and accurate the controls feel. Uh, this is a title where it all revolves around the bow. So you really got to nail that throw. You really got to make it feel like you can be precise enough 
which is why I wanted to show you this, because I was very careful when I was aiming to really get that headshot, and having that go off and land exactly where I expected it to um, felt really, really good and made me want to play more and actually try to headshot as many of the enemies as I could. Uh, so these were all solutions that they were able to come up with that, again, there was nothing uh, right over your field of view, but it was also um, within the world, and again, no, no headlock movements, because again, that's not something that you'd have in real life. Um, moving over to our first VR MMO. Um, I've been playing MMOs for 15 years, and they're, they're, they're really complex and usually require a team of a couple hundred folks to get right. Uh, this was a team of two people in 18 months, um, along with a couple other folks that came in to, to support. And they were able to build a community of players um, that, uh, and, and really make this feel like an MMO. And I felt like I could give it a, a, a fair critique because I've been playing MMOs for a long time. Um, and I think I've played over 10 so far for a number of years, the highest one being seven years. Um, they were really able to bring this community, and they had a lot of problems that they had to solve. Uh, one, again, uh, and I'll just touch on this real quick, the damage that they went with, again, was not forcing a camera perspective on you, but, but just finding clever ways to show you how you were doing. Again, they also went with the health on the weapon, um, which was a really clever way of sort of having it available whenever you needed to see it. Um, and also, one of my favorites is they, they have four classes that you can go for. But when it came to the mage class, um, you know, in, in MMOs, you, you push a button, and that's that. But the way that they wanted to do it was they wanted to make it hard. They gave it a skill curve. It wasn't easy. So you had to go around the world and find these runes, put them in your book, and then you had to memorize them. Uh, and not just that, you had to nail them perfectly every single time. And if you didn't do that, then you were going to end up like me, almost dead. Um, I was able to get him, uh, but it was close. Uh, so really, like, really giving players that sense of thrill, of tension, really feeling like they're in a world that's alive. Um, and when it came to inventory, and you know this is super hard with MMOs because they're like one of the titles out there that has the most inventory. And if you're like me, you're a hoarder and you want to keep everything. So this was really tricky. Um, and they were able to come up again with a way to sort of like overlay uh, this over the real world. And they had this really awesome way of summoning the menu, uh, which is something that I think you can't do enough of are gestures and taking advantage of those. So the delight in actually doing this to summon the menu with touch is I can't put words to it. Um, I would encourage you all to try it and give it a go. So when you did that, you came up with this menu that was overlaid over the real world. And as you needed it, you would actually push the buttons, uh, again, tactile interactions to be able to sort of navigate, customize your character as you needed to. And then to finish off with this, um, one of the things that I feel they got really right was it's an MMO. You want to see people around. I had to be really careful because I didn't want to grab anyone's names. Um, but you want to feel in a, you want to be in a world that feels alive, especially with an MMO. Uh, so they had this uh, ship that would actually fly over you as you were going around, um, and that was you know the the visceral feeling that you got um, was great. Uh, so they were able to do a couple really clever things that uh, helped this make like m made this feel like a true MMO. Moving over to uh, Ultra Wings by BitPlanet Games. Uh, here, you actually get to be uh, a pilot. Um, and one of the things, the clever ideas that they came up with to sort of make it feel like you were in-world, um, which I think you can't do enough of, and you'll see this later with another uh, very famous title, um, is, hey, you're going to be a pilot. You start off. Uh, you see the ship in the back. Uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead, grab that helmet, and put it on. That is amazing. You can't do enough of that. Uh, really get into character because you want to be a pilot. Um, so that's something that they were able to do really well. Um, when it came to the menu, again, no, no headlock. They were able to do, uh, they used a laptop, which was in world, uh, that you would go ahead and push and select the missions as you needed them, um, which was, again, really smart. And also when it came to controls, uh, and this is something that, uh, again, some, a place where touch really shines is you can't, I can't stress enough the delight that you get of actually holding the thrust and, and figuring out your way and having that feel really good and having like, uh, feeling like you have control over it. Um, and another thing that they were able to do was uh, presenting all of these options at once could have been overbearing uh, and a little overwhelming maybe for people that are newer to VR. So they were really smart about setting up a, a system where you would start off simple and then add a button permission. Uh, and then the replayability was that, in my case, I got one star out of three on all of them. So my completionist wants to come back and, and get that three star. Um, and then as you went on, you, you, know, you had to flip the dial, you had to flip the button, push the button, 
turn the flaps on where you were going to land, which is what I was doing right here. Uh, so again, all serving towards pursuit of presence and keeping the players in the world, um, which I can't stress enough. Um, then you come over to, to the SciTech uh, Sci Games team with Winlands. Um, I wanted to bring this up because uh, it's a great example of really fast locomotion that you would feel would make people sick right away. Um, but, you know, to, to our delight and players' delight, they were able to come up with a couple options. So, you know, you have your comfort mode, and then you have me. I want the intense, immersive, I'm probably going to get sick with this um, mode, um, which wasn't the case because they were able to nail this really, really well. Um, and basically just giving the player options. So in this game, you have these claw-like tools that are your main tools, um, and they actually overlaid the menu over them but they were able to keep them off of, out of sight so that you, know, you wouldn't have that coming up all the time on your HUD. And they were able to really uh, do a good job of sort of showing you basically the, uh, part of what you do in the game, the core mechanic, is that you go and you swing and you sling around this world. Um, and you have to be really careful because you can't always get to each one of the, the branches that you're trying to get to. So they were able to come up with visual indicators that help the player figure out is that close or far enough in a way that, again, didn't pull them out of the experience. So really kept them in world. And that's something that they were able to do really well. Um, and over here, I'm actually, I'm actually hanging off a cliffside. Um, but because the controls felt, uh, felt really good and I felt like I was in control of my own movement, I felt very comfortable. Um, and as you can see here, I tried to get there. I couldn't. I fell a lot of times. Um, but yeah. Uh, so moving on, um, the Red Storm and Ubisoft team uh, brought us Star Trek Bridge Crew, which lets you reenact your long-lived dream of sitting next to Uhura, potentially, or to just sit at the helm. You'll see that I picked this one because it's my personal favorite. Um, and just to speak really quickly to a couple of the things that they did really right, and one of the things that also serves for, for presence that we're seeing uh, take flight is social co-presence is really important. Uh, there is a magic to sitting here with three other players and going through this experience together and also forming relationships. Part of the reasons why I've played MMOs for 15 years is because of those relationships that I've built. Um, folks that I you know, get to go and have dinner with every once in a while, even though we live thousands of miles away. Um, and in the case of their control scheme, they had to find a way to balance it and really make people feel like they were working together. Um, so when it came to the helm, um, which again is my favorite, so I'll harp on it a bit. When it came to the thruster, they actually had you pull the thruster. When it came to all of the, all of the uh, different points that you see here on screen, you actually had to turn that dial up as needed. You had to go ahead and steer where you needed to go. Again, very involved, uh, players really engaged. Um, and you can't help but role play and start calling uh, your captain, captain, uh, which is what I ended up doing. Uh, and then here, uh, this is the lobby menu when you get ready for your match. Um, one of the really cool things that they were able to do was sort of show a little bit of what that other player is doing so that you still feel that connection from the moment you're in the lobby, which works really, really well. Uh, moving over to the Fit XR team. Uh, they brought us Box VR. Um, in Box VR, you are able to uh, reenact your, your, maybe your Rocky fantasy a little bit and really take some punches and really encourages you to move in VR. Um, this, this was a, they, they were able to nail a couple things right here. Um, the locomotion in this title, as you can see, is very limited. You're not really moving out of the space that you're in for the most part. But um, they were able to give you different environments to sort of um, keep it fresh and sort of give you options around, make you feel like you were going to different places, even though you were actually still in this space. Um, and then they also gave you multiple options around things to do, which is a really good way of, again, driving engagement, retention, and keeping people coming back. And when it came to the, the, their onboarding and sort of showing you how the game works, they used actual TVs in the back of this gym to convey that. And then they had a, a quick little exit button to show that whenever you wanted to get out, you could just step back. Um, again, really creative ways of sort of solving uh, for UI and, and not breaking that presence or bringing you out of that experience, which is something that they were able to do really well. Um, also, when it came to showing you uh, things that are happening on screen, uh, and you'll see this a little bit on some of our next titles that are coming up, uh, they, were able to, they wanted to show you when you were doing well by actually having points come up on the screen. They overlaid them in the real world. They are not stuck to your face, so it feels comfortable, um, and it's not too heavy on you, which makes it feel good. Moving over to uh, Robot Invaders Dead Secret. 
Um, this to me is a really good example of uh, storytelling in VR. Um, I am a big fan of story-driven games, and I'm excited to see more of that in VR. Um, they made really clever use of text that was overlaid on the real world to sort of convey a lot of information. Um, and again, really, in, in this one, I was uh, trying to hide from them. Uh, I hope I didn't give too many people spoilers here. Um, but they did a really good job of making you feel like you were traveling to different worlds when this title actually all takes place in one house um, and is, is gaze-driven because this is a mobile title. Um, so they did a really good job of making you feel like you were going to places in a way that was comfortable, but also did a really good job with storytelling and being able to convey information, really take advantage of the real world uh, to still keep that sense of presence, even when I was being scared out of my mind and not jumping. Um, then uh, we move over to 11 by the team of Four Fun Labs. Uh, this was a group of three people uh, who were able to create uh, an environment where that, was, that felt true to life. And I think that's a big part of why this has been so successful. Um, but not only that, also play to the social co-presence aspect of it, um, because there is a lot of delight to be had in playing with other, other people, especially uh, across you know, different uh, vast distances. Uh, so in their case, they had to make a lot of decisions, um, especially being a smaller team. And one of the great things about all the titles that you've seen today is uh, many of these are small teams of less than five people, um, and they've been able to find success in VR, um, which, is, which is really exciting for me as part of the content group. So, um, for example, they had to make a decision around, you know, will we be able to render full avatars? Um, in this case, they decided they wanted to make people feel like there was someone on the other side. So they were able to do just the headset, um, you know, with, with what you're swinging and the touch controller and make that feel good, you, you can still feel the nuances of the person on the other side. Uh, so again, really feeling connected um, and also taking advantage of voice chat as well. Um, and when it came to, again, this is, this is another title where you're not actually moving around a lot in your environment, you're in one place. Um, they were able to give you diversity of different environments. Uh, you'll see the snow here in the room, there's two more, uh, to really make you feel like you could go to different places and have a, a fresh experience with people. And again, a really good skill curve to it. Uh, this was, they gave players options around being able to sort of decide how hard you wanted to be punished um, by, by their little robot on the other side to sort of teach you. And then, again, really true to physics because I was just as bad at it as I am in real life. Uh, moving over to another really beloved title uh, by Alchemy Labs, Job Simulator, which I believe a couple of you are familiar with. Um, here they were able to really take advantage of that interaction system. Um, everything you see in all of these is pretty much you can interact with, uh, which they did a really good job at. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd think that opening a fridge and grabbing tomatoes and mushrooms couldn't be as fun, but it actually is. So you really get to reenact and pretend like, hey, I'm a gourmet chef. What does that feel like? So they did, re they did a really good job of sort of putting you in that world um, and keeping it, again, fun, engaging. And one of our favorites, uh, they did a really good job with their mechanics around throwing. Um, so here I, I just had to include this one because I grabbed that magazine and I wanted it to go exactly where I expected it to if I had thrown it in real life, and it did. And uh, they worked really, really hard to nail that, um, but it pulled off because, again, just really give players that sense of delight. And a lot of people like to grab things and just throw them all over the place. Um, so, so the team over at Alchemy did a really good job with that. Um, moving over to the team over at Downwar Downpour Interactive uh, who worked on Onward, uh, they had a tough task. They had to bring a lot of people together in a way that, um, again, f worked towards the pursuit of presence um, and really leveraged uh, the platform. So uh, I'll speak to a little bit of these here. Um, for example, one of, the, one of the things you have to do is you have to go on missions with other people, um, and you have to figure out where it is that you are in the map. Um, usually in a 2D game, you'll just press M and you'll look at it. Um, but what they were able to do was really make that be a tablet that you actually pull out and you interact with, um, which, again, you know, didn't take you out of the world, so you still felt like you were part of it. Um, a little bit that we saw in Ultra Wings, that you actually grab the helmet and you put it on to show that you're ready to go. Um, they also did something really interesting. With, they created a spectator mode. So when you're knocked out, you can actually look at other folks and try to learn a little bit of, um, about their play style. In my case, because I'm not as good at as this as I am on 2D. Um, and again, just speaking to the social co-presence, really spending a lot of time with people in, uh, in VR and making that feel good. 
Speaking a little bit uh, about Rec Room from the Against Gravity team, they did a really good job about creating a community uh, and an environment that felt welcoming from the moment you land. So they actually created a, a dorm room, and this is the first environment that you land in when you first uh, jump into the experience. And they did a really good job of, they had a lot of information to transmit, and they were able to do it by you know, doing clever design of, of bulletin boards that showed you all the things that you could do and things that you could look forward to on your next playthrough. Um, a lot of customizations op uh, customization options, as you'll see here. And again, everything you see in the room, you can interact with. Um, so it, again, very tactile. Um, when it came to the menu, you actually pull up a watch that brings it up, um, and you actually have to physically touch the buttons. So again, also speaking to that interaction. And to speak a little bit to the gestures, um, this was a command that you can bring up to sort of express yourself. So you actually use touch to sort of pull towards whichever one of the emotions you wanted to convey. So they did a really good job uh, with this, and um, yeah. So um, to speak a little bit uh, about Sprint Vector, which you've seen today on the screen up here, um, this was brought over by the Servios team, and they really wanted to bring you into a world where you felt like you were, you know, this super uh, lightning speed uh, racer. So uh, again, they went uh, they went with slightly longer hands, as you'll see here. But what they were able to do, and this can work really well, is they actually made them sort of ghostly. Um, which, which actually works really well. Uh, they didn't make them too long, so roughly to about here. Um, and they were able to leverage uh, the buttons that you see, see, see here to sort of show whether you were using a, a specific ability or not. Um, then to speak a little bit to this part here, um, they had to show you how far you were from everyone else. Here you can see how bad I am uh, because they're like really, really far ahead. Um, they had to convey the fact that you're at a checkpoint, so they didn't headlock that. They actually had it sort of pop into the world, which felt really good. Um, and again, didn't take you out of that sense of immersion that you want to get. And here uh, you'll see my brief lead um, sort of, uh, you can see that they're just a little ways behind me. Uh, the really cool thing about this is they were able to sort of use the lines that you'll see around the screen to convey the sense that you are going at a high speed uh, for comfort, and it works really well. Uh, and then we have uh, Super Hot by the Super Hot team. Um, so again, uh, this in this one you are also, uh, pretty powerful. You're going through a simulation, uh, again, using that headset and putting it on to really bring you into that world. Um, there was a room that you sort of landed in where you could interact with all the objects, and one of the actions is, hey, are you ready to execute the program? And you actually pick up that floppy and you plop it into the computer. Again, really taking advantage of all those interactions with touch. Um, and then also when you were in the simulation, really, uh, they did a really good job of figuring out, hey, time is going to be our core mechanic, um, so let's take advantage of that. So every movement that you did had a consequence, um, but again, within world. So I had a really fun time coming up with creative ideas here uh, to sort of um, uh, evade. So there, there wasn't a single path towards me being able to solve something, um, and I had a lot of fun just, you know, sort of moving around and pretending like, you know, I was a little bit of Neo. Um, so again, really giving players options and ways to do things. Um, and the other thing that they did really, really well was they went with a very unique aesthetic. So they knew what their vision was, they went with it, and it worked. Um, yeah, so. Um, there is a, I wanted to do a little bit of Q&A, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so I think I, we might have time for a question or two. If not, feel free to grab me here right after, um, if anybody wants to raise a hand. No, I think we are good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Thank you, everybody who tuned into the live stream. All right. Have a good one. Enjoy the show.
Hello? All right, hi, everybody. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> uh, my name is Phil Greenspan. I've been working at Oculus for about five years now. Uh, I like to joke that I joined a Kickstarter and got a little carried away. Uh, lately, I've been working on the developer strategy team. In all of my time here, I like to focus on content because I am a gamer, and this is my one chance to basically just play video games for money. It's a good thing. Um, hopefully, I can use some of my uh, expertise and domain knowledge to help make your games better and make them launch uh, in the best and most effective way possible, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So I've got a couple of key points. Mostly, we're going to talk about the first three, which are once you have an idea for a project, let's evaluate it and make sure that this is something we really want to build and is going to be awesome. Then we're going to talk about what to do before launch, what to do after launch, as well as a few helpful resources. And to get you to stick around, there is a picture of a very cute dog on the way. So first things first, you've got an idea for a VR game, and that is awesome. And now we have to decide, well, what, what are we going to do with it? Build a demo. Always build a demo. Build a demo for yourself, right? The demo is to prove out that the ideas that you've had, the thing in your head really does translate. And it translates into a fun and exciting experience that people are going to want to come back to and keep playing. And that's the purpose of the demo. So we want to make sure that within the first few minutes, it's really easy for anybody to imagine the rest of the game, right? You make a quick vertical slice, but there is, there is a game there, and it should, be, it should be really clear what that game is. But it's not just the big picture. You have to also show that you know, VR is about getting all of the little things right. You know, Deb was up here talking about all of the delight that you can drive through good interactions and good UI, and all of that is absolutely true. In this case, within that first demo, that first vertical slice, what we're looking for and what we're hoping you're trying to prove is that Yes, I can. I have answers to those hard questions. Maybe I haven't built out all of the levels, but I know what the questions are. I know how to answer them. Here it is. Right? And last and certainly not least, be awesome. Right? This demo, this vertical slice, is going to be the thing that decide, tells people whether or not they want the rest of it. Right? So there has to be something about your game that is unique and amazing and awesome. And we want to make sure that that's in the first vertical slice. OK, so then you've got your game. You've got your ideas. You've answered some hard questions on how you're going to build it. Well, why are we even doing it? Why are we doing it in the first place? You know, uh, I spent a few years working as an indie dev. And I, I don't know how I gained this self-awareness. But I knew that those games were never going to make me any money. They weren't, that's not what they were for. The thing I wanted out of those games was to learn how to use Unity. I wanted to learn what the process was like submitting to different app stores. I wanted to go through the process of iteration and creation and ship so that I knew those things. That's why I made the game. That could be why you're making the game. It could be that you're trying to make money. But if you're trying to make money, how much money, right? Are you trying to pay for beer or are you trying to raise VC money? Very different products, right? <laughs> Very different goals. Or maybe you're just trying to get people playing your game. You're trying to grow a user base, trying to grow your community. Also good goals, very different products. And you're going to have to make very different design decisions to achieve those goals. You know, a story I tell a lot is about Babe Ruth. The reason Babe Ruth, like anybody could hit a home run. The reason Babe Ruth was the greatest of all time was that he would call his shots. He said, I'm not, not just going to hit a home run. I'm going to hit it over there. And that's what made him amazing. And that's what you should do with your games too, right? It's not just about making a great game. It's about calling your shots and proving to the world you can do what you say you can do. OK, so we've got a cool game. You know people want it. But eventually, you have to ship this thing. So who are you making the game for? You know, I told my story. I made it for myself. But probably, you're mostly going to try and sell your games. So you're making it for somebody else. Look at the product market, right? Is there an audience for this title? Or at least ask yourself, how big is that audience, right? You have to have some type of projection around, well, what does success look like for me? Because it could be very different, very different from game to game.
But the important part is feeling like you hit your goals. Last but not least, you're not doing this alone. We're at GDC. There are thousands of people here that you can learn from, that you can teach. You are not in a vacuum. And I, I've, I've been there. I've spent a lot of time late at night hammering at my computer screen. It's part of the fun. But remember that eventually this, this goes out into the world, and, and you want to make sure that your game lands in, in context. OK, so we've got a great game. Cool. Let's ship this thing. So first and foremost, we need two weeks. From the time you first send us a game to when we can put it on the store, we need two weeks. That's mostly actually for you, right? We can do our review in a couple of days, but we want to give it back to you with enough time to you know, make whatever changes we need, whether it's a performance thing or a VRC. We'll talk more about those later. We want to be able to give that back to you, let you do the work in a measured, controlled, non-rushed way, and then send us back the build. We'll give it a thumbs up, and then we can ship it. Now, if you want to do anything else, we probably need more time than that, right? Do you want help picking a release date? Do you want help you know, building out a new feature? OK, we can do all that stuff. We can help you with those things. Probably not with a week before launch. Give us a little more time. We'll help you out. And when you do send us a build, let us know what you want, right? Because I, I want to say yes so badly. I want to help you so badly. But to do that, I have to know what you're looking for, right? So do you need engineering help? Do you need design help? Do you need a go-to-market strategy? We do all these things. It depend I'll tell you to talk to different people, depending on what you need. If you just say we want to launch the game, we'll launch your game. If you want something else, just ask. And, and this, is, this is actually a really key point right here. We're not going to try and force your game into our structure. It's not what we do. What we do want is to take your game, to see that magic, and make it as good as it can possibly be. We're all about amplifying what you already have. I, all the time people say, what kind of game do you want us to build? I don't care. I want you to build an amazing game. You figure out what kind of game you want to build. I'll figure out how to sell it. I, I'm not sure why I needed to put this in a slide, but it's, it's true. A lot of people start their marketing when their game launches, and it breaks my heart every time. Start your marketing early. Uh, I know ads are sin, but as it turns out, Facebook ads really do work, right? Like any kind of ad system. Promote your game. Market your game. Put it on Twitter. Put it on Facebook. Put it on, put it, put it on a building. doesn't matter, but tell people about your game. If the, the opening weekend of launch for any product, movie, music, especially video games, the opening weekend is the most significant weekend you'll ever have. There's a lot you can do to try and revitalize that, but you have to, have to land your opening. It's going to set the tone for everything else that you do. And to do that, you have to market it before you launch. Now, ways you can market it, talk about your game. It's an easy one. Talk about your studio. Game devs are rock stars. Look around at where we are. You are celebrities. So tell people about your life. Write a development blog. Have it face customers, have it face other developers. These are all ways where what you're trying to do here is saying, hey, we've got this awesome thing, and I can either prove that by showing you the awesome game, or I can prove that by showing how awesome my team is. Both of those are things people really want to hear. Tell them. OK. You've marketed your game. You've got it through our submission. Everything's looking great. It launched. Oh, God, what next? You know, Deb was talking about MMOs. And if you know anything about MMOs, you know that leveling up is just the tutorial, right? Releasing your game is the beginning of the, the end game, right? That's when everything really starts. So generate marketing opportunities. We love when developers give us an excuse to feature their game. Is that a sale? Is it a free weekend? Is that a new bit of content? You know, what, whatever it is, when you have a new update coming, tell us. We will feature you. We will market your game. We love when there are new things. 
Or if we ask you to be in one, do it. It helps. It works. Putting your game on sale makes you more money. It's weird. It works. And it's not just about marketing, right? There are ways where you can drive players towards your game throughout the life of the product. And one of the most effective things here are content updates. Content updates can take a lot of different shapes. They can be DLC, they can be free, they can be new levels, new maps, new characters, whatever. It's just something to say, hey, community, hey, people that love my game, don't you want to come back? You know, I know, I know it's been a couple weeks, but, but we're still working. Don't you want to keep playing? And, and any kind of excuse for us to re-promote your game is a good thing. It brings in new players. It keeps players that you have engaged. And very specifically, watch your metrics and build telemetry. This goes back to the previous point. You're not in a vacuum. There is data here. And you can very quickly experiment and learn, okay, we did this bit of content, uh, uh, we, we added a new piece of content and it really increased revenue, great. But were you trying to boost concurrency, right? Whatever that goal is, build the content around it, market it appropriately, watch your metrics, see if you were successful, either double down or, or pivot. This is all normal stuff, but it works in games too. And we really are here to help. You have to drive your success, we can't king make we can't just say this game is going to make all the money in the world, but we can amplify what you're already doing and make sure that your efforts land as effectively as possible. Okay, a couple of helpful resources. Um, hi, I'm one, uh, but if you can't reach me, <laughs> there's a bunch of other great people at Oculus. The developer support team, they're all here. They are awesome. They are lifesavers. They know everything about our stack just as well as anybody else. And importantly, they handle a lot of the uh, one-to-many communications. So things like blogs, things like updates, that's all coming from that team. If you have a question, they're there to answer it. And hopefully, you ask it on the forum so other people can go back in and read that answer too. Oculus Start is a new program we just launched, which is also awesome out of the developer support team. Oculus Start is how you get hardware, by the way. Uh, go to that system, apply to it. It's targeted for people that have launched a game before. So we want people who've, who've made games, who know how to make games. But we say all the time, the first game teaches you how to make games, the second game teaches you how to sell them. So Oculus Start will help you get over that hump of, okay, you know how to make a game, now let's teach you how to sell games, make money, have a business. Oculus Launchpad is another amazing program. This one actually targets a wider range of content creators, both people that have never made content before and experts, but they're specifically targeting either diverse content creators or content that approaches a diverse topic, right? If you feel like you're making a game that's a little bit niche, maybe, or you're working on a team that has an amazing diverse set of uh, engineers and employees, this is a great way to get resources. You know, it would be so easy for us to make a VR headset for white males 18 to 35. We can do that. But that's not the future of virtual reality. The future of virtual reality includes people from all walks of life being whoever they are and living their best lives. And we want to make sure that in the future, the virtual worlds that we create are safe and meaningful and allow you to express yourself. And Launchpad is one of our initiatives to help accomplish that. Now, when you get ready to submit, you've already got your team, you've got your program, everything's great. Please, please go to these websites. It will keep that two week window as short as possible, right? So the performance profiler will tell you if you're at 60, will tell you if you're at 90, and it will tell you where you're not and how to fix it. The VRC validator, we bounce, we bounce submissions for the tiniest little things like you forgot an entitlement check. This will tell you if you missed the, the, the little stuff, the stuff that's like a checkbox in Unity, the stuff that you can do pretty quickly and if you get it right the first time, it'll help us get your app out faster. And if you're wondering what those guidelines are, they're right here in our submission guidelines. 
I know. Here it comes. Booker T. <laughs> um, but seriously, here's my contact information. Here's how to get in touch with me, email and Twitter. Uh, that's his Instagram. Lots of cute pictures of dogs. And that's, that's the talk. Any questions?